My name is Annette Lazat, and I am the director of Kaufman Museum at Bethel College in North Newton, Kansas. About six months ago, the organizers of this TEDx event invited me to share my experiences with a special museum exhibit, a special traveling exhibit, that Kaufman Museum has organized called Sorting Out Race examining racial identity and stereotypes in thrift store donations. And I was so thrilled to be asked. I immediately said yes. I hung up the phone and then I panicked because while I adore public speaking and I am energized by it, I had already given dozens of presentations on this exhibit and none of them was ever shorter than 30 minutes. Um, most of them pushed an hour, and these TEDx talks have a pretty strict time limit, and I knew that was gonna be a gigantic challenge for me, that I was gonna have to be very concise in what I said. And so I immediately started making lists, brainstorming ideas, I wrote multiple scripts, I put together different PowerPoint presentations, I practiced, 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 and no matter how hard I tried, I could not get this presentation down below 20 minutes. And about the middle of the summer, I realized I was going to have to do something radical. I was going to have to quit. I was going to have to put the notes away, close the laptop. I needed some mental space. I needed some time. I needed some peace. And I decided I'm going to wait until about a week or two before my presentation, and then I'm going to pull everything back out and hope that I can tackle the challenge of the TEDx time limit. But I forgot one really, really important thing. I forgot how difficult this time of year is for me. Today is September 15th, 2015, and we are four days away from marking the anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. The week before the terrorist attacks, I flew to New York City to bury my best friend in the world. I gave the eulogy at his funeral, I stood over his grave as they filled it with dirt, and as I flew in and out of New York City, as I drove through the streets, I don't think I even saw the Twin Towers. I was so blinded by grief, I was oblivious to my surroundings. And I got home, and a week later, the terrorist attacks occurred. And I did something that psychologists have since told us many people who lost loved ones in the days immediately before and after September 11th did. I stopped grieving for Michael because I didn't think my grief was important. I didn't think I deserved it. In the face of this national tragedy, I turned to national and community grief, and I forgot to grieve for the most important person in my life. And I've paid the price for that ever since. This time of year, it all comes back, and I become emotionally, intellectually, physically paralyzed. So resurrecting this TEDx talk in the midst of that paralysis was almost impossible for me. And I came to the realization fairly quickly that I was going to have to harness that grief and use it rather than let it control me. And so I turned it over to Michael and he gave me the answer. Um, in the last years of his life he didn't have a lot of money and so he couldn't afford to buy me holiday gifts, birthday gifts, Valentine gifts, and so instead he would spend days, weeks sometimes, crafting elaborately personalized top 10 lists, which were spoofs on David Letterman's top 10 lists, 
And he would make them up about people we'd gone to graduate school with or quirky family members or things that were happening in our lives or in the world. And those lists, the time and the effort he spent on those is more precious than anything he could have bought me in a store. And so tonight, to honor Michael, I am going to tell you the top 10 things you need to know about Kaufman Museum's Sorting Out Race exhibit. And we're going to start with number 10. Number 10, we've been working on this exhibit for over five years. The project began when the manager of a local thrift store in Newton, Kansas, approached staff at Kaufman Museum to express her concern about some of the racially offensive objects she was finding in the donation bin of the thrift store. She was concerned that by putting these things out on the sales floor, they could be hurtful to a diverse pool of customers, but she was concerned about the bigger philosophical question of if we resell these things and send them back out into our homes, our schools, our businesses, are we perpetuating negative stereotypes and negative attitudes about race that lead to contemporary social injustices and systemic racism? So that led us to number nine. We, oh. <laughs> We collected over 500 objects from local thrift stores. We sorted them out of the donation bins. We sorted them out of the store shelves. And we started sorting through them at the museum. Now, for a traveling exhibition that is designed to fit in a roughly 1,000 square foot gallery, there's no way you can include 500 objects. You can include maybe 100. And so we had to start deciding which stereotypes we were going to focus on, what stories we were going to tell about them, and what messages we want the viewers to take away from those exhibit objects. That led us to number eight. We didn't always agree. I entered the project very late in its development. I've only been director of Kaufman Museum for a year now. But I entered that project at a critical phase in its development when we did have to make those crucial decisions. And as a new director who was trying to establish positive relationships with colleagues, the community, museum patrons, it was devastating to me that we couldn't agree on how to approach this exhibit. And a number of people actually walked away from the project, left the curatorial team at this point. And it was devastating to me to know that even good people who are dedicated to fighting racism can't agree on how to do it. And so that led us to number seven. We focused on asking questions rather than giving answers. We asked people to take another look, to think things through, to consider how historical objects could be making an impact on our contemporary decisions. Now that wasn't without controversy. Asking questions, a simple question, is not without controversy. And that led us to number six. We were criticized for asking, is the Kansas flag racist? I will tell you <laughs> that the central medallion of the Kansas flag is adopted from the great seal of the state of Kansas. And so we asked museum visitors to critically examine the center medallion and ask themselves questions about it. And some of the questions we posed were, who in this scenario historically benefited from agricultural cultivation and 
settlement. And, and the foreground of that medallion shows a farmer plowing a field with a wagon train and a log cabin right behind him. And we asked the question, who historically benefited from the establishment of business and industry? And that's represented in the seal of the state of Kansas by a river with a steamboat chugging down it. Who could read the Latin motto, ad aspera per aspera, at the top of the seal? Who was educated enough to read, translate, and understand that it meant to the stars through difficulties? And then finally, we asked who is marginalized in the imagery on the Kansas flag. On the left-hand side of that seal, there's a green hill, and there's what looks like a couple of brown dots on the hill. And they are actually silhouettes of Native Americans on horseback chasing five buffalo off the side of the seal. And the pushback that we continuously got was, well, this is just the history of Kansas. This is just a factual depiction of the establishment of the state of Kansas. White settlers moved in. Native Americans were pushed out. You can't deny that. Well, no, you can't deny it. But that doesn't mean you have to celebrate it or embrace it either. South Carolina has just grappled with this issue as regards the, con the Confederate battle flag. And I think it's ironic that both the Confederate battle flag and the great seal of the state of Kansas were both designed in 1861 against the same historical backdrop. Number five, we were surprised at how many people felt Native American sports mascots were positive symbols of pride, strength, and leadership. And I ask you the question, do we ascribe the characteristics of pride, strength, and leadership to Native American mascots because we think those are the qualities of character that someone who has historically been oppressed or traumatized needs to emerge successfully from that experience? Is it the way that we assuage our guilt and deny culpability in that historical oppression? And yet, number four, we were gratified that the word most frequently used to describe our exhibit was sensitizing. There was a guest book in the gallery where visitors could sign their names and write comments. And they repeated the word sensitizing, made me more sensitive, sensitizing over and over again in that guest book. And that really was the primary goal of our exhibit. It was to heighten awareness about our continuing struggles with race. And that leads us to number three. We knew the stakes were high. We knew the stakes were high. We had a section in the exhibit that was dedicated to the stereotype of the black man as criminal. This is one of the artifacts from that section. It's an antique postcard. The date is on the back, 1915. This is 100 years old. And I will pose the question to you. Can you look at this postcard with the same eyes that have seen the events in Ferguson and Baltimore and Cleveland and New York unfold over the last year? Can you look at this postcard with those same eyes and dismiss it as quaint, funny, old, and harmless? And if it is harmful, then what do we do with it? That leads us to number two. We're not sure what to do with all this stuff. Um, I will tell you uh, that as a museum director, the idea of putting it all in a museum is terrifying to me. We don't have enough space or money, people, um, to build enough museums to contain all this stuff. So do we throw it away in the trash? Do we ceremoniously collect it and dump it in a big pile in the town square and burn it? Do we leave it closed up in boxes in our attics, basements, storage units? What do we do? 
we pose that question, we don't necessarily know the answer. Now, for those of you in the audience who are type A personalities like me and who don't like all of these questions without answers, just tell me the answer. I will give you one answer. The number one thing you need to know about Kaufman Museum's exhibit is there's nothing racist about the dress. If I could have the photo, please. Our exhibit gallery recreates the environment of a thrift store. We've reconstructed a window with a door and a little bell that rings as you go in. And I purchased this fabulous ball gown at the local thrift store to create a visually stunning entrance to the gallery, just to catch visitors' eyes so that they would be drawn in. And yet the number one question that people asked us about this exhibit is, what is racist about that dress? They just assumed that everything in the exhibit was racist. Well, there's nothing racist about the dress. It's intended to set the stage and to show you that sometimes when you walk into resale environments or antique stores, uh, these objects that are racially offensive and hurtful are hidden amongst other everyday objects like clothing and household goods. I'll give you one more answer, because again, for the type A people, I know you need this. Um, I just said we don't know what to do with this stuff. Well, I'll tell you that at the end of the exhibit, this dress is going home with me. So I do know what I'm doing with that thing. I hope all of you get to see the Sorting Out Race exhibit as it travels around the country. And if you don't get to see it, I hope that the next time you walk into your local thrift store, you'll look at it with heightened awareness and with new eyes and with greater sensitivity. Thank you.